Today's video is presented in partnership with Hampson Auctions, one of the UK's leading classic, performance and supercar auction houses. Their next sale takes place on the 24th of November at the magnificent Bowlesworth Castle in Cheshire. Today we have this stunning Aston Martin DB9 for review. The DB9 was in production for 12 years from 2004 to 2014 and three special edition models of the DB9 were produced. The DB9 LM, Zagato and the GT. This is a 2005 DB9 and this DB9 is resplendent in meteorite silver over a black Nero interior with silver wheels. And this particular car has quite a few performance upgrades, particularly around the suspension system. This car has Polyflex poly suspension bushes and also it has a DBS anti-roll bar in addition to whole new dampers all around the car due to the original dampers failing. When the DB9 originally went out for review to journalists, Evo magazine pulled it up on the fact that its handling was very poor and they were the only journalists to say that there was a problem with the handling. This was then resolved downstream with Aston Martin upgrading all the dampers. The DB9 power plant is a naturally aspirated 5.9 litre V12 pushing out 450 brake horsepower, 420 pound foot of torque, will take you from 0 to 62 in 4.9 seconds and has a top speed of 186 miles per hour. As you can see, it's not quite front mid engine. You've got your front axle here. So it's set quite a bit behind the axle. So it's not front engined. It's sort of a bit front mid engine, but not really as you would with a front mid engine car. It's not too far set back. And this is a, an incredible V12 engine. It actually says six litre on the front, but it's, technically it's actually a 5.9. Now, one of the interesting characteristics of the naming convention for the DB9 is that the previous model was the DB7, but they skipped the DB8 because they were concerned people would perceive that the DB9 might be, or rather what was is the model that would be then named the DB8, maybe perceived to be a V8. But interestingly, when they came downstream to naming an Aston Martin a DB12, that particular DB12 model was a V8. So that concern obviously went out the window because they had a, a DB12 that was actually a V8 when they were worried about naming it DB9 for the D, the, when they were worried about naming the DB9 a DB8 because of it being perceived as a V8 when actually of course it's a V12. While we're here it's very important to mention one of the major upgrades made to the engine. This has sports catalytic converters and one of that the, the real significance of that is that the catalytic converters were originally designed into the exhaust manifolds very very close to the exhaust ports and what that meant was when the exhaust catalytic converters when they broke up it was perceptible to the fragments of the catalytic converter going into the engine system and actually causing engine failure. So the, a, a very common modification made to these V12 engines is the catalytic converters removed from the exhaust manifolds downstream to sports cats downstream further down in the exhaust system which makes it a lot safer which then isn't susceptible to those parts then going into the engine and causing major catastrophic engine failure. Looking at the rear of the car you'd think it has have quite a substantial luggage capacity in the boot but That's no good to man nor beast. You couldn't even get two, two cabin bags in there. It's very, very small, very constrained for space, which quite surprised me. I, I expected there to be quite a good bit of luggage space in the back of the DB9, but there just isn't. So even though it's a GT touring car, it doesn't really provide for much luggage space and much luggage capability if you're on some Euro trips, etc. So now we're gonna take the DB9 out on the road and see if I can drive it like James Bond. Yep, I had to get a James Bond analogy in there somewhere. So out driving the DB9. First of all, going through some internal cabin ergonomics. It's very plush and luxurious as you'd expect, but there's a massive dash here, which is resplendent in black leather, but it is quite a substantial size. The seats are very comfortable. You can get a very good driving position in the seats, uh, but there's a weird characteristic. It might be how the seat has been set up and I've you know, not really changed much of the configuration of the seat, but there's a dip in the back. So it sort of pulls you back or sits you back in the seat. 
um, which is uh, just a bit strange. It's neither good nor bad, really. The driving position is very good. I can clearly see the instrument cluster. You've got your rev counter on the right-hand side and your speedo on the left-hand side, and you've got nice visibility through the top of the steering wheel uh, for access to be able to read the gauges. The one thing that really screams out at me, though, and it's... I guess just the way this car has been specced, it just seems very boring with its specification. It's all black or what looks like this dark grey material. It just doesn't look very enticing. Yes, it's very comfortable and very plush as you'd expect with an Aston Martin, but it's just not very voyeuristic. It's just not great to look at if I'm being honest. So this car is a naturally aspirated V12, has 450 brake horsepower and 420 pound-foot of torque. And you can certainly feel that torque, it pulls from very low. And of course you've got that fantastic Aston Martin growl, which Aston Martins are well known for. The 5.9 litre V12 is coupled to Aston Martin's automatic transmission, which is just the standard torque converter transmission. It's not a dual clutch transmission. It does fit in very well though with this 5.9 litre V12, especially with that 420 pound foot of torque, which really pulls the car along from very low speeds. It makes it very much the luxurious GT that it's designed to be. However, it still has that substantial sporty edge. You have that rorty exhaust note, and with that torque and 450 brake horsepower, it really pulls it along at quite a pace. As you'd expect, the suspension is very compliant, but a bit too overly compliant, a bit too soft. But that's to be expected in this sort of Aston Martin GT range. The steering, as you'd expect, is quite lazy again. It's a GT car, it's not a sports car. Um, it's interesting uh, as a, you know, can't really do a comparison, but we've just literally got out of a Ferrari 360, which was upgraded to challenge the Dow specifications. So it's very, very different drivers you'd expect. So you've really got a direct comparison there between uh, an on-edge sporty supercar and a Grand Tourer. Let's drop it down a gear and see what the performance is like. See there, the gearbox is quite lazy, but lazy when compared with a dual clutch transmission in a supercar. When you're talking about a Grand Tour of this nature, then it fits in very well with this lazy V12. If you're enjoying the video so far, please give the video a thumbs up. Very important for our channel. And if you like our style of content, please think about subscribing. Now back to the video. The steering fits in very well with the DB9 scenario. It's not overtly fast, but it, again, it's, it's not overtly slow either. So again, it fits in very well with, with the DB9 GT characteristics. I wouldn't say you can feel very much through the steering wheel. It's very heavily assisted. But then it's a Grand Tourer, it's not a supercar. So what do you expect? Brakes haul the car down um, quite well as you'd expect it to, which is very much a requirement because this is quite a bit of mass. It's around 1700 kilograms in weight, so 1.7 tons. So that's quite a bit of weight to haul down. And even though it's quite a, even though it's quite a svelte, looking sports light car it really isn't it's a grand tourer and as that weight would define it's no as that weight would define it's not a lightweight by any means the, as you will have noticed there one of the uh, initial one of the interesting characteristics of the accelerator is it's very urgent at the beginning so it's very much on off at the very beginning I've noticed this when I pulled the car out of the car park, the, the wheel span. So it's got very sensitive throttle, definitely at the initial stages anyway, uh, which isn't great. So that could be doing with having a bit of a sneeze factor there. Visibility on the DB9 is actually quite good. When we compare it with the 360 that we got out from, the 360 from its B pillars backwards was pretty shocking. But this is a breath of fresh air. You've actually got good visibility from the B pillars down and from the B pillars forward. 
you've got this quite steeply raked front glass but it's at a good angle so you have good visibility through and the A-pillars are quite slim so it's, they don't restrict the visibility at all. With regards to placement of the car, you can't see or I can't see the front bonnet at all and I can't see the front wings. But because the DB9 isn't extensively wide, it's not such a problem to position round corners. currently driving it in sport mode we're going to now switch it out from sport mode to see what the characteristics change to I suspect it'll do a bit of a, an engine map change and probably change the characteristics of the gear changes so yeah I'd say with the sport with sport mode off it's a little bit more lazy Sport mode sharpens up the gear changes a bit more and puts a slight improvement in on the engine mapping. So put it back into sport mode. Yeah, and you can feel a little bit more urgency there. I would say that the DB9 is great as a mile cruncher as a GT, but the problem is the rear luggage space is, is not very good at all. You'd pretty much get one cabin case in there, if that which is a, quite a surprise. You've got a bit of space in the back. Um, it's a four-seater and the rear seats are pretty much non-usable for humans. So you'd be a lot better off if you're doing any grand touring in the car, you'll be a lot better off using the rear seats for storage space in addition to the minimum um, constrained luggage space that you've got in the boot. Let's just do, while we've got a um, free space here, we just do a pull from a, a very slow rolling start just to see what the performance is like say this is supposed to be accelerated from 0 to 62 in 4.9 seconds As you can see it's no slouch <laughs> that v12 definitely hauls it along and the brakes pull it back quite nicely again not far off two tons of weight here so it's you'd really need that stopping power to be consistent which it is one of the key upgrades that's been performed in this car is it's had replacement upgraded dampers the original db9 had issues with road holding due to the dampers not really being fit for purpose but this has had replacement dampers because the original ones leaked and Aston Martin did upgrade the dampers downstream, which has made quite a substantial improvement to the road holding of these cars. The DB9 was built on a whole new chassis architecture called the Vertical Horizontal Platform. And this platform was subsequently used for many downstream models, including the DBS, the Vantage and the Rapide. If you were looking to purchase your first supercar or add a car to your collection, Rich Reviews has already helped multiple owners secure their dream supercar. We have a mix and match of services to help take the pain away to ensure a happy, memorable purchase away from the stress that can be caused by car research and dealing negotiations. Our mix and match of services include telephone support calls, pre-purchase inspection and car collection video. For more information, please contact me via message in the comments below or at the following email address. Now back to the video. When considering the DB9, you really have to compare it against what it was designed for. It was designed to be a Grand Tourer. A lot of people perceived it as being a sports model, and yes, it has sporty looks, but really, as borne out by the characteristics of this 5.9 litre V12 at 420 pound foot of torque, it really is tuned to be a Grand Tourer. And I can easily see how this would could be used for eating up those miles, of course, You've got a deficit with regards to the luggage storage space in the boot, but as I said, you know, you've got the space behind the seats um, using those rear seats instead of uh, a seating capability, use them for luggage storage, which would overcome that problem as long as there's only two of you on the journey. It'd be very interesting comparing the DB9 with the DBS because the DBS has perceived a lot more sportier version. And I think it probably would be, it'd probably give it a little bit more of a sporty edge, but the DB9 is 
but the DB9 is definitely a Grand Tourer and needs to be perceived as such. And of course, with an automatic box, you also have the option of putting it fully into auto mode and just letting it do its thing and really driving it in full GT mode, which is again, a great characteristic and pretty much what this car was designed for. When you change gear manually, once it's in auto mode, then you put it into manual mode and then you just have to press the drive button again to put it back fully into auto mode. I hope you've enjoyed us bringing you along for this luxurious drive in this beautiful DB9 Cruiser. Many thanks to the owner for providing this and the Ferrari 360 for review. Thanks very much for watching guys and we'll catch you in the next video.